I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And I can't believe it. We're at that time of the year. We're going to start running down some of the best, some of the worst things of 2020. Today, we're going to talk about the top 10 comic stories of 2020. We will wrap this up on the last day of the year with the top 10 comic issues of 2020. And we got a lot of content in, be in between there. Now, we're not going to go like top 10 DC, top 10 Marvel, top 10 indie stuff. They did That was way too much last year. So we're going to we're gonna narrow it down and, and get some good lists for you. And obviously here with me to talk about this is El Percherino himself, the Poobah of comics. Perch, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. It's insane. It feels like just yesterday we were doing these lists. Yes, I, I agree. I remember where I was exactly when we were doing this list last year. This, <laughs> this has been a very, very, very strange year. Very tumultuous, but we have got some very good comic issues and specifically good comic stories that we're going to talk about today. Now, before I get into this, I do want to say if you haven't subscribed, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, give us a thumbs up if you enjoy this, give us a thumbs down if you don't. We definitely want to hear your favorite comic stories of 2020. Now, getting to the first one, this one, I'm doing a little bit of a cop out of my first one. Obviously, DC Comics is heavily invested in these 80th anniversary, giant size milestone issues. We've got a lot of them in 2020. I did want to point out two short stories that I thought were very good comic book stories. The first one is called Four in Green Lantern, 80th anniversary, 100 page spectacular. I can't remember the full name, but that one is by Robert Viditti and Rafa Sandoval on art. And it's basically, I don't know, it's the closest thing as you're going to get to a slice of life comic in my list. And then the other one is called Always in the Wonder Woman 750 issue that came out in January. Shockingly, this one was written, written by V.I. Ayala. It's the best comic I've ever written or read by her. It's about uh, Diana Prince kind of going back and revisiting, I think her name is Silver Swan, after she kind of saved her. I just thought they were both brilliant. Yeah, they were good stories. I, I think um, the the Always story was wound up kind of capping and fixing a lot of things in the run that uh, I believe was G. Willow Wilson, I think, who who originally did this, the the story that this was kind of teeing up. And I think uh, Vita did a very good job of, of fixing that. So it was it was a solid story. And, and four, I think, was a very good book. I, all, all around a very, very good book. I think it proved why a lot of people were hoping Robert Menditti would have something to do with Green Lantern or Justice League or or somewhere, I think he he does a really good job with these characters, and it, it, that was a. These are both very very good stories in the anniversary. I think these were the top stories in those anniversary issues, uh, by probably a pretty good margin. Yeah, you know, I almost shed a tear reading for. Obviously, I expected nothing less really for Robert Venditti on Green Lantern, but I was shocked by Vita Ayala. She, you know, Gail Simone has had a classic run on Wonder Woman. Greg Rucka has had a classic run on Wonder Woman. The big story in that was going to be Scott Snyder resetting uh, Diana Prince as the very first hero in the DC universe. And I thought it'd be uh, Vita Ayala, Ayala actually kind of showed them all up. Very surprising. Yeah, that was that was the best story. And I guarantee you a lot of the people listening to this are going, what the hell right now? But but seriously, it, it, it is. Go read it. Art's important. good, too. I can't remember the artist's name, but she, she did a great job. Yeah, it's a, it's a solid story for sure. All right. So let's get down to number nine. And this is maybe surprising, Batman 3 Jokers. You and I have talked about this on the channel. We did a wrap of, a, of it. How we were a little bit disappointed, and I think the disappointment was really wrapped up in my own expectations of what the joke or the three Jokers was supposed to be in my mind. Obviously, this is, this is Jeff, uh, John, Jason Fabok, the best illustrated comic of 2020, I believe by a pretty wide margin. Yeah. Now, this isn't the best Jeff Johns comic story I've ever read. But this is very solid, a very good comic book. And I think history is going to shine uh, very well on this. Obviously, it had been set up in uh, Dark Side Wars, uh, Detective, uh, I'm sorry, Detective, DC Comics Rebirth. And I, I think he delivered the goods in the end. Yeah, I think so. I, I think if you came into this thinking this is going to matter to DC continuity and it's going to tie up a bunch of Rebirth storylines and architect part of the DC universe, you're probably disappointed. It's not that. It's, it's a classic Batman detective story. It, uh, it it hits on a lot of, of kind of what the comic has been and where it was. And I do think it will age very well. I think people will forget kind of the, the long delay and the fact that they set something up in Justice League way back when. And they'll just look at it like a, a solid Batman story. And and so I think, you know, it 
it did well. It's a good story. It, it was an entertaining read and it gave you what you wanted. So I, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. And maybe the best part about it is it gave some shine to Jason Todd. You know, obviously Red Hood and the Outlaws, he's had his own series for a while, but you never really get to see him elevated. And it felt like this story in particular really went back and looked at, at the way he's been affected over the years, how he, you know, internalized his trauma and dealt with it in different ways as opposed to Barbara Gordon, who seemed to do it more healthy, and how he came to this point. And, you know, Jason Todd's such a really good, complicated character, and I just love seeing him get elevated and, and maybe get some more screen time. Hopefully, you know, they'll, be, they'll continue to do that with it. Yes, absolutely. I, I There's a lot to build on. We will get a sequel, um, supposedly this year, but <laughs> it is same creative team. I mean, it could be 2026, but we'll see. Obviously, yes, this, this one was delayed many times, but I think in the end, they got it right. Yes, for sure. So moving on to number eight in my top 10 comic stories of 2020, Something is Killing the Children. We'll go with the very first volume, issues one through six. This is James Tynan's uh, breakout hit on Boom. Obviously, he's got the Department of Truth going on right now. I think he's also got Wind. Very interesting art selections on this, but there's a lot of lore explored and, and um and created in this it's basically a monster story the, you know the house of slaughter we got this really mysterious character showing up in town after these monsters have you know essentially eaten these children and um very dark stuff this is one of my favorite horror comics of the year yeah it's it's a great horror book it has a little bit of a, a mystery suspense feel to it for sure as well it's uh yeah it's a very good book it, it's it's weird that with all the promotion that's gone into this book it still seems to fly under the radar for a lot of people uh i'm, I'm not sure what's missing here in terms of getting the graphic novels or the trades out or something but uh it always surprises me that this this book is uh relatively unknown but it is a very very solid book it's got a track record now that that is reliable and it tells a very good story. It's um, it's it's definitely something to check out if you haven't for some reason. It is the time, and this was that was obviously your setup arc, but really good stuff, really good art. James Tinian, this is probably my favorite work that he's doing month in month out right now. Easily mine. Yeah, definitely better than Batman. I think definitely better than Department of Truth. This is a really solid story. And inadvertently had one of the coolest you know uh, pandemic era you know uh, accessories you could get with that House of Slaughter you know, mouth guard that, that she wears. Merchandising, it works. Absolutely, <laughs> you know. Uh, he didn't plan it, but I, I hope he was selling those. I, I bet anybody that was reading the series would want to walk around with one of those bad boys. <laughs> absolutely. So, absolutely, if you're not reading Something is Killing the Children by Boom, you know, definitely get on that one. That's a great story. Let's move on. I think number seven is next. What do we got? Ah, this is, this story would be much higher if the uh, Tennis Swords event hadn't kind of downplayed it and minimized it, made it somewhat not important, but the Moramasa Blade story that was in uh, Wolverine and X-Force, it had the same creators. It was Ben Percy writing, Victor Bogdanovich on art. Wonderful introduction to, to the new villainous character. Uh, for some reason, the name is escaping right, right now, but it's a, you know, Wolverine travels to hell to gain a Moramasa Blade, we end up uh, meeting the character and it's just wonderfully illustrated, super dark, excellent story. It's just too bad that in the end, all the things that we learned ended up being not important. Yeah. I mean, it was this introduction of uh, a solemn. Um, yes. Yeah, solemn. There we go. I have the same problem though. This, this character's name will not stick. I don't know why, uh, but uh, yeah, this was a really good story. Kind of Wolverine going to, you know, uh, the, the Inferno talking about the hand, uh, this kind of hellish landscape um, you know, introduction of Solemn, pretty cool powers. Uh, it, it was just, it was a good one-two punch. Uh, Victor Bogdanovich, his art look, look incredible. I mean, at, at this point, Marvel really needs to be thinking about this is, you know, this is the next kind of Ryan Stegman for us that we could boost up and build into a event type artist. Uh, really, really good story. I completely agree with you. It didn't matter, uh, in the grand <laughs> scheme of things. So I'm I'm really hoping that what will matter is going forward in the Wolverine book, you know, following up on the hand. There's obviously some pretty cool stuff that got introduced there. The the character of Solomon is running around out in the world somewhere and is going to cause trouble. Uh, the Muramasa blade, we we saw the hint that the two blades do not like to be separated, so they'll need to come together at some point. Solomon has one, Logan has the other. So I I, I hope they they make more out of this story because it was a really cool story, really well done, captured Wolverine and 
And, uh, you know, it was, it was hard to believe that you read this and, and like four issues later, you know, Wolverine's at a dinner party. Like it just, yes. <laughs> and then a few issues later, when we finally have Wolverine and Solemn come together in combat, you know, Solemn's like, well, I let you live in hell. So you owe me a favor. You're fighting for me. And then you never see the character again until you see him escaping through a gate. That's literally the only time you saw the character after that. Yeah, definitely a really cool character setup that was completely not used. Um, so very wasteful on Marvel's part. Well, it, and even weirder from the standpoint of they they set up some storylines in in Wolverine that Solemn was was disliked uh, by the other horsemen that there was a lot of personal blood there. Uh, he killed there. one of them's husband. Yeah, there was there was a, a deep kind of thing there that then they just never touched on at all. Yeah, well. They, there was no room for it because there was time. They needed to do hijinks. Yes, they needed they needed some shenanigans. Yeah, yeah. You had to kill a cat. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> otherwise, this is this would be a higher story if it was more important. But this is it was great on its yeah. own. Yep. Number six is the, from Vault Comics. Obviously, they have a great horror and science fiction line. The plot is going to be wrapping up very shortly. This has had one of the weirdest release schedules I've ever seen. I think it's been releasing for like. A year and a half now, even though it's only like an eight-issue story. But this is from Tim Daniel, who I believe actually designs all the graphics and logos for Vault. Um, mm -hmm. Michael Morici, one of the very underrated talents. He's a very uh, he's an excellent writer. Anytime DC or Marvel let him do something, he does a great job, and then they never put him on anything. And then Joshua Hickson's art just like screams seventies horror. It's, yeah, it's a brilliant series. It is. It, it this is a um, again. It's another one that's completely under the radar for for a lot of people. It's really really solid. If you do like horror, you like suspense, like dark, very moody art. Um, this is a great book for you. And in many ways, I think it it does what uh, what what witches from Scott Snyder was was trying to do. Just just I think it it does it a lot better. I think it it really is about kind of the the relationship of of uh, sacrifice and and what it means to kind of enter into these deals and bargains. I don't want to give anything away, so now I'm trying to kind of make my words carefully. This is a book that that has, I think, some spoilers that would hurt the book's experience. So uh, be careful what you read out there uh, before reading the comic. But this is a great comic. I think it is collected in trade at this point, so you can grab that. So uh, very, very good. Yeah, it's it's all about family and consequences. That's, yeah. that's what you do. Family and know. consequences, yes. Yeah, so um, super duper moody. I love the use of weather yeah. to add to the to the ambiance and the experience of the comic book. It's just beautifully rendered. An excellent uh, comic book. Hopefully, Tim Daniel and Michael Morici keep working together. I know they've done some other books, but absolutely um, the best comic book out of, from from uh, from Vault. And Vault's been doing brilliant work for a couple of years now. Yeah, very very. So, good. Yeah, moving into the top five. Me personally, I think Daredevil, as far as uh, you know, superhero comics has been the best ongoing series, you know, in, in the industry for for quite some time now. I, I think right around what is it, Mortal Hulk, maybe 22, 23, I think that one started to fall off, and Daredevil just kept ascending. It was yeah. hard to pick one story because it's been so consistent. But I'll go with Daredevil Inferno. That was an issue nineteen and twenty. This is Chip Zdarsky. The primary artist is Marco Chitetto. He's he he does story arcs at a time. This is pretty awesome. This is like the culmination of everything Zdarsky was building. We've got Crossbones, Rhino, I think Bullseye. They've all descended into Hell's Kitchen to, to ruin it so the Strohmines can buy it for under market value. And you got Daredevil, who's been trying to uh, come to grips with the fact that he murdered somebody. He's back to back with Wilson Fisk as they try to defend the neighborhood and save everybody. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's a cheat, like you said. This this built on what was eighteen really powerful issues of setting up the plot and some some good kind of nuance that character. So you you really felt the sacrifice, you felt the destruction, um, you felt this this. And so when Wilson Fisk and, and Daredevil have to kind of join sides for a period of time, I mean it's it's very it's a weighty moment. It's not cheaply put together. Uh, art looks beautiful. I, I think uh, Marco Cicchetto is is just putting out incredible i mean even this little thumbnail you've got here just the color and the the use of the whole picture is, is really really solid and it's uh it's a it's a real shame marvel's not not promoting this more 
as a book. Uh, its sales remain you know, fairly low, and it's just uh, hopefully now I guess with the Electra reveal it will it will get better. But it is it is an incredible story. Probably Marvel's um, easily I, well not probably the easily Marvel's consistently best title of the year. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, it, like I said, this is the culmination at the end. Once they save the neighborhood, Daredevil, who's had the the weight of that. Um, the fact that he killed a man, weighing on him, Spider Man and him had a you know a, a heart to heart earlier in the series, and you know at the end of this he, he kind of turns himself in, and that is the beginning of, of the next story arc, which is what we're in right now, and a just beautifully transition from from one moment of Daredevil and the story he was working with there, and transitions it perfectly into the next. Yep. Yeah, it's so. it, it's great. Uh, it's a great series. I don't know who at this point you've been watching this channel, and at this point this is a surprise to you. I'm not sure what to tell you, but definitely go check out Daredevil. Great stuff. Absolutely. So we're getting into the big ones. This one's probably going to maybe don't surprise some people. This is my number four. This is one of my genuine surprises mm -hmm. of 2020. Um, yeah, you know, there was a a slow comic book week, and I didn't really have much to read. And I was like, well, John Carpenter's Vortex 2.0. I, I like John Carpenter's thing. You know, I, I like Big Trouble in Little China. I've liked a lot of stuff John Carpenter's done. Let's read this comic book. I re immediately figured out he wasn't writing it. And I was like, well, he probably storyboarded it. But it turns out Mike Sizemore and Dave Kennedy are just blowing it out with this awesome sci-fi horror, you know, alien-themed comic. It feels like what if when Ripley and Newt, you know, got frozen and they got shipped out, when they got saved, what if when they woke up, they had discovered the aliens and started using them to advance technology and culture on the planet they are at as, you know, to their absolute horror as they realize that they have no idea what they're actually working with? Yeah, I mean, this is a better, uh, this would be a better Aliens 3 or... <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, it, it, it definitely, this is where the series should have gone. No, it's it's funny that Sizemore, um, it feels like Carpenter. It, it definitely has that same kind of style of horror and, and mix of sci-fi and, and everything else. Um, the art looks really solid on this book. Um, like you said, I, I very, very, very under the radar. Uh, not a book anybody talks about, really. Uh, but, but I think it's from Storm King Comics. I, don't, I never even heard of that label. Storm King Comics, that's right. And, uh, yeah, I mean just very silent again nobody talks about it and and you it's hard to find this online very few people pirate this stuff i think uh i think there's an interesting lesson in here around i don't believe this company provides a lot of comps out to new sites and so remarkably you don't you don't find it online anywhere so it's like huh. um but not that i'm saying anything but maybe a little bit uh but it's a really good comic it's worth checking out you can find it uh relatively cheap i i was trying to just see while we were talking if there's a trade available for it but i don't see it uh, There's definitely a trade for John Carpenter's Vortex, which was the first story. This is actually the sequel. Yeah, I don't think they've done one for 2.0 yet. It is up to eight issues by the look of things. So it just good. completed issue number six. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. This one is solicited in advance. So I'm, I'm looking in the advanced solicitations and I'm not seeing any trades for it, but but hopefully soon. This is a good book. I would definitely go check it out. It's It's cheap to come in. It's really strong art it's it's a good mood it, it's it's all very very good yeah, yeah i went back and read vortex the, the original i read it in one city I, yeah. I started reading i was like man this is so good i love all these characters and it really builds on all that stuff in 2.0 but you don't even need, really need to read the first one because i was able to keep up without it no i mean sizemore has been around for a, a, bit, a bit of time and and is a really strong writer again not somebody you hear about but really really strong in the science fiction and horror side of the world and uh, definitely, definitely a recommendation to check out. And I just Most. now I just found it looks like they're going to wait until the eight issue series. It's, it's an eight issue event or eight mm -hmm. issue book, and then they're going to release the trade. So that's why it's not out yet. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. And what are we? What are we in the top three now? Yeah. We are in the top three. This is my. I think this is my highest. This is my highest rated big two comic. Yeah. I think it is. We got the last god. It's not a superhero comic, but this is on Black Label. Bill Kennedy Johnson, the new writer for Superman in Action Comics, brilliant art by Ricardo Federici. It's insane, you know, what Tolkien's uh, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, you know, it just created an entire genre. And you see so many people trying to really recreate or, or, or kind of ripping off Tolkien. And even bad Tolkien is kind of decent, but this is really good, 
really good fantasy stuff. Easily the best fantasy comic I've read in a very long time. It's like a multi-generational. He's telling two stories of the same quest 30 years apart, and you're learning how the first one failed and all the things that are stacked against the second uh, quest. And it's just – Philip Kennedy Johnson puts in the work. He, you know, In True to Tolkien, he's got poems. He's got original music. You can even play um, – like a dungeon and dra- like if you play D and D, there's a source book to where you can play the last god in your D and D game. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> which is uh, it, there's a lot there. It, it's just a really solid story. I you know what's funny is I've I've talked to some people who feel intimidated getting into this book because they feel it's uh, it's it's having to dive too much into a culture or a, a, you know all this other stuff. You don't need to. It's it's a very easy book to jump into. It doesn't require dense reading. It is a very you know solid, well-rounded story, but it's it's not unpenetrable. You can you can very easily pick it up, get into it. Um, very solid, you know, from the the man who's now going to write Superman and action comics, be a pretty major part of DC stable going forward. Uh, this it's a, it's a very solid book. I'm reading this. I'm very encouraged by what I'm going to see out of uh, Aliens at Marvel. Absolutely. Um, that's that's probably more. I have more, but uh, from reading Last God, I'm more interested to see what he does with aliens in some ways in Superman. But but we'll see. It's a good book. Um, yeah, the, there's just every month this comes out, and it's a guaranteed solid read. And he, you can tell he's a, he's a musician because this book is crescendoing. It didn't peak in issue number four or issue six. It's peaking as it ends, which yeah. is the way it should do. Absolutely, it does not limp to the finish line. No. And so the next one, I, I guess I accidentally teased this. The next one is Spider-Man Last Remains. It will be in, ending uh, very shortly. This is in the pages of ASM 50 through 55. Nick Spencer, Patrick Gleason, Mark Bagley talking a lot about um, One More Day. We're seeing a lot of very dark things happening to Peter Parker at the hands of Kindred. We had Kindred, you know, essentially teased for, you know, two years starting in, in issue number one. It feels like Nick Spencer has, has really redeemed himself and paid off that that reveal. So many times the, the the payoff is underwhelming. This feels like it's exceeded any expectation anyone could have had. Yeah, I, I I've enjoyed it. Now I, I'm a little bit more reserved on this because he's he's got to stick the landing, and I do think he does. I think how well he sticks the landing is going to make this either you know really the best Spider-Man story we've had in in five years or more, or probably longer. Or it's gonna really upset people. Like he has Nick Spencer is now walking a tightrope. He can he can easily go either way uh, by how this ending comes in. So I, I'm with you. The the mood has been good. I think this did advance very nicely from the Sins Rising storyline, which was which was odd at various times. I think this has done a good job. Um, and and the core title, the spin ons uh, to this, the, the Spider Family stuff's not been as good, but the. This, the the core title is is some solid moody type stuff, and uh, this this uh, by the way this cover this little image by Patrick Gleason is one of the best uh, coolest Spider Man images we've seen in forever, uh, but I want to see that ending. I, I'm I'm really hoping he sticks the landing because he's teed up a lot of things that could be very very cool for the series, but he's got to stick that landing. Obviously, I have faith putting it here at my number two. That I'm like it's been so great this this far. I, I can't say I'm flubbing it. Of course, you know I've been wrong in the past. <laughs> we'll see how but I, I put some faith in Nick Spencer. So now it's time to talk my number one. This was my biggest gem discovered in 2019. It was Christmas week. There were no new comics that I could find. I found The Kill Lock number one by Livio Ramondelli from IDW Comics. I knew that he had done some some uh, illustration illustration work for Transformers. It was a robot comic. I gave it a shot. And boy, was I happy I did. This is obviously completed. You can get this in trade. It's it's a really nice small story about four robots. They've been given the kill lock, which is essentially a death sentence. When one of them dies, all of them will die. And you know, you, you got the artisan, who's absolutely the, the star of the show. He's absolutely insane. We got the laborer, who's an alcoholic. And then we have the wraith, who has a really dark backstory uh, that, that you get kind of worked out at the end. But they're all trying to protect this little guy, a defective a newborn robot that is sentenced to death just because he wasn't born perfect. It, yeah. It's so good. It's a really good story. It, it it provides a lot of depth and emotion, and and uh, there's some plot twists in there as well. I mean, there's some. It's it's a really good story. You don't expect it from a four robot story. Uh, it's yes. it, but 
you know, you, you have a lot here. It's, it's really, really solid. You get some very good character work. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, this was a nice surprise. I think you turned me on to this and uh, it was a great, it was just a really good, solid comic. All right. And the, the writer artist, Livia Ramondelli, he, you know, he, he saw my review, which I thought, I thought that was cool when he came back and it sounded like we might be getting some sequels to this. So I'll be looking forward to that. But until then, if you haven't read the kill lock, from IDW, it's it sucks so bad that IDW is known for licensed properties because they really do have some great original stuff. The Killlock being in there, the Highest House, uh, Canto, you know, out there, and uh, they just don't get the love because they put have to put all their promotion into their licensed work. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I think it's I don't know. It just has to have more to it. It was a great series. It was it needs to get out there more. I'm not sure what's going on behind the scenes, but uh, even kind of the the after promotion, this this whole series being collected in a trade and put out would be very smart to do. So hopefully we'll see a lot more from it. Absolutely. So that is my top 10 comic stories in 2020. I think we hit a lot of good ones. You're not quite as uh, you're, you're somewhat optimistic, but also pessimistic about Amazing Spider-Man Last Remains. All right, Perch, is there another, is there a story or two that I didn't count that you're like, what the hell were you thinking, Les? No, no, I, I think there are a couple. There's there's one book on my list, uh, Blue and Green, which was a standalone graphic novel that was really well done by Ram B. I thought that was a really good series. Um, or, 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 we'll be talking or, about that one tomorrow with Joe. Okay, there you go. I think that's <laughs> a great, great comic. Uh, something very, very good to pick up and look at. Again, one that maybe a lot of people didn't hear about. I, I think Donnie Cates did a good job of that first Thor arc. And mm -hmm. I think that Ram B did a good job with Justice League Dark as he came onto that book. Um, and then probably Tartarus, I think, was a book I enjoyed a lot this year. But, um, but you know, it, it, was a, it was a very weird year. Obviously, a lot of strange things happened, delays and, and everything else in the comics line. But um, all in all, it was, uh, you know, there's some good stories out there. You just had to look a little bit for them. Absolutely. It feels like 2021 is going to be the year of the independent. I'm calling it right now. Yes, I would agree. All right, buddy. I do appreciate the time, and this is fun. We're definitely going to do a couple more of these. Excellent. Looking forward to it.